Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we survived Heritage Day, did we? <laughs> I want to thank all of you who attended. And, you know, I asked Roxanne um, what she thought of the show. And she said it proved what we've all known for a long time that you have absolutely no shame. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good time. And I, I apologize, we were a little late with lighting the candles. But at John's age, he just moves a lot slower <laughs> these days. So again, I welcome you all. And now we are beginning our 178th year at Salem United Methodist Church. Yeah. And that is reason to be very proud. Not proud of anything we have accomplished, but proud of the fact that for 177 years and one day, this church has persevered. And that is a great tribute to all the people who've gone before. Because one never takes pride in witnessing the gospel. But we do take pride that we have outstanding forebearers who carry the weight of this church with the Spirit of God through some very, very difficult times. Now, whenever I give a tour of the old church and the cemetery, people are always amazed. When I tell them that at one point the old church was blown off its foundation and just set back. When I tell them that it burned down and within the same year it was rebuilt. When I tell them that much of what they see here was built by people from the church, the labor of, of hands of people in the community. When I mention they did not have indoor plumbing until the 1960s. But that points to something very, very special. A church exists for two reasons. One, because of the Spirit of God moving in that church. And two, because people want that church to exist. And so we do have reason to celebrate. We do have reason to be joyful. And we also have reason to be filled with hope. Because I know many times when we look at a congregation and we say, oh, the congregation is smaller than it was 20 years ago. And what are we going to do when the congregation shrinks? How many times do you think that has been said in the history of Salem? I would imagine many, many times. Many a church council meeting was no doubt held in the 20th century. They said, what are we going to do about the church? I would imagine when it was blown off the foundation, what are we going to do about the church? When the Spanish flu hit and there were many people in this congregation who died, family, entire families who died, what are we going to do about the church? And the answer is we're going to persevere. And we're going to celebrate the gospel, and we're going to live as messengers of God's love, and that's exactly what we're doing today. So we do have cause to celebrate. And the biggest cause we have to celebrate is in that acclamation we start with each Sunday. This is the day that the Lord has made. 
Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, no matter what we walked in carrying today, and I know all of you walked in today carrying something, carrying a burden on your heart. A burden of family, a burden that you're facing, a challenge that you're facing, something in your life that's troubling, someone who you love very dearly who's suffering. And so now we ask, though, to experience God's peace. To experience, it doesn't take our love our concern for our loved ones. It doesn't take those burdens really off our heart, but it says that knowing we can trust in God for wisdom, for guidance, for strength and hope, that's a certain peace. So let us now offer to one another a sign of the peace and the love of Christ. Hello, peace. <laughs> Way back there, hello. <laughs> Hey, Penny. <laughs> way back there and way up there. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, Donna just had to tell me my shirt was not tucked in. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, when you're in show business, you know, sometimes you forget to look at things. <laughs> I apologize for that. All right, announcements this morning. First of all, today would be our normally scheduled church council meeting. We are postponing that until next Sunday. Uh, we do have some we, we do have some charge conference business to attend to, and we're waiting for some paperwork on that. So we will meet next Sunday immediately after the service and conclude that, uh, wrap that up pretty quickly. So I do apologize for that, but again, as always, all people are welcome to attend our church council meetings. Also, um, okay. Also, we are, we've been invited by our conference superintendent to participate in a special workshop next Sunday, the 26th, beginning at one o'clock at Valparaiso First. It is a workshop on spiritual exercises. And I know that term can be a bit off-putting to people, but what a spiritual exercise actually is, it's just a way that we deepen our relationship with God. And things like prayer, reading of scripture, contemplation. It's an excellent workshop. Uh, the person leading the workshop is the uh, Reverend Kent Lundy. He's actually an Air Force chaplain who's doing a lot of work with spiritual exercises. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be very insightful and a great opportunity. Anyone who would like to attend, it's free of charge. Simply see me after the service today and we can make sure you're registered. It's gonna be, I think it will be a very, very good experience. Are there other announcements this morning? All right, there being none, let us be about the reason we've gathered today with our call to worship. <clears throat> Please stand as you are able for the call to worship, which can be found inside your bulletin. <coughs> we gather as messengers of the good news. We draw near to you, O oh Lord. We gather as the body of Christ. We walk in your pathways. We gather as a community of faith. We give thanks for we are saved by grace. We gather with joyful hearts. Please join us in our opening hymn, Come Christians Join to Sing, and that is on page 158. Now you may not be familiar with this song, but one of the reasons that I asked Donna to pick out a song was the timing. This particular song was written in 1843. So I am certain that this song no doubt would have been sung in those early services at Salem Church. So again, uh, come Christians join to sing their three verses with an introduction.
may be seated. This is the time in our service where we pause and we reflect on how we experience God in our everyday life. And I know we call it God sightings, but please don't think that means that we have to go looking for God. It simply means we have to open our heart to where God is in every single moment of our life in the joys of our life, in the concerns of our life, in the doubts, God is present. God is present every time we recognize that we are not in control. Every time we're able to say to ourselves that, that we are not the final solution, we are not the final answer, we are not able to control the circumstances of life, but we can walk through them with God's strength and God's spirit. And so, I begin today, as I do many times when, when we talk about God sightings, by thinking how I experience God through this church. And I really do. And that's what I was talking about earlier. I experience God through this church because I experience what it means when the Spirit of God is joined with the heart and the hands and the lips of people. That's the beauty of the church. That's what makes a church a church. And I see God in each of you, and I see God in this community, I see God in the history of this church, and I see God in the future of this church. And that to me is a great, great joy. Other God sightings this morning. Okay. Last week, Pastor Tom gave us all little papers with the names of victims from September 11th. And I researched the name that I had, and it truly was a God sighting. Because at that moment, it gave humanness to not only that man, whose name was on my paper, but to all the victims. Um, I discovered a little bit about him. He was from India. He was 37. He left a widow and an eight or nine year old boy. The boy was still back in India because of health concerns. Um, that was about all I could find out about him other than the fact he was a computer technician working for an American company. But all of a sudden, he became very real to me. And I tried to find out more about his widow, but unfortunately, she was here on a temporary visa because of him, and she most likely got deported the following November. And from that point, I've lost track of her story. But um, that was truly a God sighting. Yeah, that's amazing. Penny brought that up, and Elaine went on the computer and found the two people that we got, and they were kind of young. You know, one was 22, if I remember right, and 27, 27 yeah. So they were real young. And one was for like a investment firm. Okay, that's and, great. And the other guy, you know, he did a lot for his community. Okay, that's awesome. We do that, and I'm really glad you, you all brought that up. Because what that shows is God creates connections. And even though this is a great tragedy, we are now connected. And that's what I talked about uh, as we remember 9-11, is that we are connected to everyone who suffered and is suffering because of that. And that is how we have the call to live as Christians, witnessing peace and justice. And thank you for doing that. Because when we connect with the humanness of a situation, then we can feel the divinity of a solution. And that's really, that's really beautiful. And that's, that's why we do things like that. Thank you, John and Elaine. Thank you, Penny. Yes, Donna. I was surprised when I put in the names that the faces came up mm -hmm. uh, automatically. It was not a whole big list of, okay, right. it could be this person, this person. It was that one. That one. Mm -hmm. When you can look into the lives of a person, when you can look into the eyes of a person, then you have that connection. That is so rare because just think about what we were watching on TV for 9-11. We were seeing lists of victims, or even the memorial service, that I thought was incredibly touching. And I think Herb mentioned that uh, last week. The memorial service was just incredibly touching as they're reading the names. Well, now we know those are people who have lives, who had families, who had hopes, who had dreams, who had careers, who had opportunities, and we're connected with them in a very special way. So thank you all for doing that. That's, that's wonderful. And that is finding God in the midst of a tragic situation. Also, um, this week, coming week, we have some birthdays coming up. Adam celebrated his birthday on 
<laughs> no, I think, no, he celebrated his birthday by setting up tables and chairs, and I think that says happy birthday better than that. Um, uh, this week we have Jenny Higgins has her birthday on uh, Tuesday. Mike Wallace has a birthday on, I think it's Wednesday. Austin Chaz has a birthday on Thursday, and Mark Biggs has a birthday on uh, the 24th. So we have a lot of birthdays coming up this week and the, and the joy, joy of life. And there's one other birthday. Um, oh yeah, John's, John's birthday. So we want to say happy birthday, John. Actually, I'm, joined, I'm joining 90 percent of the crowd here. I'm 70. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, we should say happy birthday, John. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's okay. Who's saying something back there? My hearing's going bad too. Yes. You know what? Why don't we sing happy birthday for all of the birthdays we have? No need to play the music. Just start us off, Laura and Elaine. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Salemite. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> very good. Very, very good. And I started to say our sanctuary candle today is in memory of John Rado. I meant <laughs> in honor of his birthday. So, my, my mistake. <laughs> also, uh, <coughs> Elaine, could we have an update on Keith, please? He's alive. <coughs> yeah. He's still alive. But, um, we, are, we are praying as a community for Keith. And uh, our prayers, of course, for healing and, and wholeness and hope in myself and also uh, we want to pray for June uh, for her continuing recovery uh, pray for her family uh, they were standing with her through her through her recovery from a stroke and we certainly want her to know that uh, we are all with her in, in prayer um, how's Lloyd doing this week I'm doing better I, uh, my eyesight is improved he know. actually drove out here oh well, very good, good. Oh, first yeah. time he's That's driven good. That is awesome. So we have <laughs> All the people are a They said yes. I'll give you a five minute head start when you leave. That's okay. I th I think that's I think that's great. Yes, yeah, that's great. And I know Peggy's a little dizzy this morning, so we want to keep you in our prayers. What's new? Or what's oh. <laughs> oh, she gave me the look, Jack. Now sometimes parking lot after church. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I don't always experience God in everybody. <laughs> All right. Any other concerns? Yes. I heard from Holly Russell uh, okay. last night. She has COVID. Oh, gee. So you don't remember. She was the blonde that sat back here with the walker. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we'll pray for Holly. She's had a, she's had a very difficult year. Keep her in our prayers. And Jen, welcome back. So good to see you. Great. All right. Yes, Karen. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for prayer for our little great granddaughter, Nina. Um, she went into the emergency room and oxygen and suctioned her, and she's back home. But still, keep her in your prayers. But I am grateful for that. Too. We will do that. Thank you. All right, let us center ourselves in the presence of a loving God, a God who knows each moment of our life, and each moment of our life we can have a sacred moment if we open our hearts to God's presence. Living God, we pray today for those who suffer within our community. We pray for Keith Williams in a very special way. For your healing presence to touch and comfort him, we pray for peace to come upon his family. We pray for hope to live in his heart. We pray for June, our beloved sister in Christ. May your spirit dwelling within her restore her to the fullness of health. Restore her to become part of this community once again. Open her heart to know that she is joined with each of us and that she's in our thoughts each and every day. We pray for Holly 
We pray that your healing presence may comfort her, may nurture her, may sustain her, may bring her to the fullness of health and hope. We pray in thanksgiving for baby Lena. We know that she was touched by your providential care. We know that the prayers offered in her behalf brought hope and comfort and peace to the family. We pray that you'll continue. We pray because we know that you'll continue to abide with her throughout her recovery. We pray in thanksgiving for the gift of life as we celebrate birthdays of Adam, of John, of Jenny, of Mike, of Austin, and Mark. May each of these lives continue to stand as a powerful gospel witness and a witness of hope. And we pray in thanksgiving that you have called us to be in relationship with those who've suffered great tragedies, such as that day of 9-11. For in that relationship, we build a clear and hear a clarion call to serve, to love, to work for peace and equity among all people. Continue to open our hearts to those times of brokenness. Open our hearts to those times of tragedy so that we may know it is our task to continue the good work of building your kingdom. We lift all of this to you in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of confession, which can be found inside your bulletin. Holy God, through the gift of your Son, you gave birth to your church. From that first Easter dawn, the church of your Son has proclaimed your glory and called people to walk in the light of your wisdom. Yet the world, crafted by human hands, has hardened our hearts and caused us to turn from your abundant grace. In your mercy, forgive us for those times when we have failed to live, act, and speak as your church. Open our hearts to your will, so that we may testify to all the world that Jesus Christ is the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We now enter into a time of silent prayer and meditation. It's a time when we experience the fullness of God's presence. God is ever present in a very intimate way in each of our lives, causing us to always grow more into the image and the likeness of Christ. That's the beauty of faith. And in these times of silence, we tend to, we need to walk away from the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of our everyday life, and we need to seek God's wisdom. Now, in today's epistle that uh, Penny will read, we will hear about this idea of two kinds of wisdom, wisdom of the world and wisdom that comes from God. And so today, I simply want us to close our eyes, center ourselves in God's presence, and think about the word wisdom. Open your heart to what God's wisdom means. Open your heart to what, how God's wisdom speaks to you. <coughs> and you will see the difference between God's wisdom and the wisdom of the world the way crafted with human beings. Amen. Amen. 
And honestly, sometimes if we look at the epistle of James or other writings about God's wisdom, we tend to look at it as something far off, something that's simply a goal, something very esoteric, not something we can actually hold within our hearts. But truly, all of us experience God's wisdom in every decision that we make. Because we know what course we should take, what action we should take. It's when the language of the world talks us out of that. We know it is right to be a people of peace. We know it's right to be a people of justice and fairness and equity and truth. But many times, that true wisdom of God that is always present is not something we have to run after. That true wisdom of God <coughs> suffers at the expense of the wisdom of the world. <coughs> and so today, as Penny will certainly read in the epistle of James, we talk about this idea of true wisdom. And then we compare it to the kind of wisdom that we see in the world, the wisdom that says we have to always get ahead, we always have to go up that escalator above somebody else. We always have to have certain possessions or power. We have to put ourselves in a position where we feel we are in control of our lives. And so that's the wisdom that tends to guide us, the wisdom that says, we have to make sure that we compete with everybody else because there's just not enough to go around. There's just not enough power to go around. There's just not enough money to go around. There's just not enough hope to go around. But yet God's wisdom is much different. God's wisdom causes us to go down that escalator. To go down that escalator and move out of our own lives to be people who are hospitable, people who are loving, people who are surrendered to God. And so as we lift our prayers and petitions this day, let us do so invoking God's wisdom to truly be our guide as individuals and our guide as a church. Please respond, hear our prayer. For the church of your son, to be filled with your spirit, to be guided by your wisdom, and to be a messenger of peace and hope and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Salem United Methodist Church, as we begin our 178th year of gospel witness, to continue to be a place where your wisdom governs, your love empowers, and your hope strengthens. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers for all who suffer. And today we pray especially for our brother Keith and our sister June. We pray for the victims of 9-11 with whom we are now joined. We pray for all who suffer physically, emotionally, and spiritually. That your healing presence may touch and comfort them that your strength will nurture and sustain them, and that your hope may live within each of their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for all who grieve, those whose loss is recent, yet those who continue to bear the pain of grief, that they may find great hope in the legacy of lives lived well amid the human condition, and find peace in the promise of the empty tomb. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers for victims of violence, injustice, hate, and fear. That the church of your son may be an advocate of hope, a place of welcome, and a voice for justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for those prayers residing only in the silence of our hearts and minds. For those loved ones who we care for who are suffering in a wholeness. For those who despair, to know peace. For those whose lives are uncertain, to know hope. And for all people, to know the promise of your Son. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayers. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 This morning's epistle reading is from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 13, 4 to 3, and 7 to 8. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, 
by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, then, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Please stand as you are able for the gospel reading. Today's gospel is from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Well, this is really a very interesting gospel. And one of the things we pastors often do is we just pick out one section of this gospel and preach about it. And that really takes away the message that Mark is trying to convey here. This is a, a written piece of irony. And that's what Mark does throughout this gospel. He puts in these situations that are very ironic, and it's called sandwiching. That's actually what they call the process that Mark uses in writing this. So he begins with this very prophetic message that Jesus tells about himself. It's this self-revelation. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to be, I, I'm going to give up my life, I'm going to be killed, and then on the third day, I'm going to rise. Now, we hear that because we've heard it our entire life in church, right? And so we think, well, that's pretty understandable. We know what's going to happen, you know? We know exactly what's going to happen, so it doesn't strike us as that unusual. You know, in fact, I had, I had, a, I had an algebra teacher in school and yesterday I talked about how I was the class clown and this woman just didn't really hated me for some unknown reason. How could anyone hate me, right? <laughs> but she was, she never married, but she, she would go to these movies, okay? And when the movie, The Greatest Story Ever Told, remember the movie that? The Greatest Story Ever Told? She came to class, you know, and she said, I was really disappointed in that movie. And we're all thinking, okay, now you're telling us you're disappointed in Jesus. She goes, you know, I'm watching the movie, and it's like, you know how it's going to end. 
It was funny at the time, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, they're not all golden folks, you know. You didn't pay to get in here, okay? <laughs> but that's the way we look at it, okay? We know how it's going to end. But then the second part of this gospel text is, the second part is the disciples. They don't know what's going on. Why don't they know what's going on? They are afraid. They are afraid. What do you think they're afraid of? What do you think the disciples are afraid of? They are afraid of knowing the truth about Jesus. Because that's not the Messiah that they wanted. They wanted a Messiah who was going to go into, into uh, Jerusalem and drive the Romans out. They wanted a Messiah who was going to ride in on a white horse. They wanted the Messiah that had been prophesied about in the Old Testament. They did not want... A person whose only tool was love and mercy and forgiveness. That's not the Messiah they wanted. They were afraid to know the real Jesus. They were afraid to know what was really going to happen. And you know what fear is? Fear is the opposite of faith. We actually believe many times, and pastors often preach this, that the opposite of faith is when you're an agnostic or you're an atheist or you just don't care. You just don't care. How many articles have we seen in the last year in internet postings where it says the biggest category of people listed are people who call themselves nuns. They don't have any church affiliation. That what, that's what's happening in, in generations. That's not the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith is fear. And that's what the disciples felt because they could not accept this Jesus that they were seeing. And then the third part of the gospel is really interesting. The third part of the gospel is when Jesus calls the little children to him. That's a very touching scene. Jesus puts his arm around the little children and, and says, anyone who welcomes these welcomes me. And we, in the 21st century, think of that in a much different way than they would have thought about it in the first century. We think, oh, isn't that cute? Jesus wants us to be like little children. Jesus wants us not to question. Jesus wants us to simply, to simply say, we'll believe everything. That's not what this message is. In the first century Palestine, there was an honor and a shame culture. There was no middle class. There were the very, very wealthy, well-to-do, and then the very, very poor. And at the very bottom of the list were children. Children did not have any social status, particularly female children. Male children would grow up and they would be heir to whatever the family had. But children had no social status. So what Jesus is saying is, I'm turning the world upside down. The kingdom of God doesn't work the way the world is working right now. The kingdom of God embraces those who are the least. The kingdom in God embraces those that the world has rejected. That is the whole message of this part of the gospel. So we add those three things together. Jesus revealing who he is and what is about to happen. The disciples living in fear of finding out who Jesus really is. And then Jesus saying, welcome the little children, welcome those the world calls the least. And now we have to ask ourselves as Christians, where do we put ourselves in that gospel story? Where do we put ourselves in that gospel story? Can we say, can we just stop when Jesus says, I'm going to be killed and rise again on the third day? Or do we hear the rest of the gospel about what it means to have faith in that? Or do we fear, like the disciples, what it would mean to really get to know Jesus Christ in our life? Do we fear what that might mean for us? Do we fear what change it might make? Do we fear how it might transform us? That's the reality we face. And are we truly prepared to welcome the least in the world? Are we truly prepared to welcome those that the world rejects. 
And what keeps us from doing all of those things is the same thing that keeps the disciples, or kept the disciples from doing it, fear. We fear perhaps finding out what Jesus Christ really means in our life. We fear perhaps having to welcome those that the world rejects. We fear finding out the depths of how much we need God through Jesus Christ. We fear maybe losing our position or our prestige or our power if we do that. We fear. The antidote, though, to fear is not just developing this false sense of courage. It's not going into just pseudo-Christianity where I know all those Christian phrases and words and terms and things I can say and I have my bumper stickers. No, that's not the opposite of fear. The opposite of fear is having real faith. Beginning with the statement Jesus makes at the beginning of this gospel, having faith that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead, conquering evil, guilt, and sin for all time, and then being willing to live that out by embracing the least among us. And that requires that we become the least as well. That requires, as I said earlier, that we go down that escalator from our own high perch and we become the least. Because every time we join with someone the world rejects, we have to call them brother or sister. Not just someone in need, not just someone who's different, not just someone who is the other, but someone with whom we have a connection. That is what Jesus was telling the disciples. And it was a hard message for them to accept. And it's a hard message for us to accept. It is a hard message for us to accept because it's contrary to what the world tells us. It's contrary to the message that the world gives us. It's a very, very hard message to accept. So as we close today, I'm going to ask you to do just one, one thing. Okay? I'm going to ask you to... Think about fear in your own life as it relates to faith. What fear is keeping you from having the fullness of faith? What fear is keeping you from experiencing the fullness of Jesus Christ? What fear is keeping you from opening your heart fully to Jesus? And I think in my case, it's fear of what that might imply that I would need to do. Fear that I might have to change something with which I'm comfortable, with which is normal for me, that, that is predictable for me. That's the fear that I hold. Close your eyes. Ask yourself in God's presence, what fear is keeping each one of us from truly knowing Jesus Amen. And I suggest that that's something that you can do each and every day as you reflect and contemplate your relationship with God. Because the one barrier to our relationship with God is often fear. And as that fear can lessen, our experience of the divine will grow. And another way that the experience of the divine grows is when we join at this table. Now John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said that participation in the Lord's Supper is a special means of grace. God's grace is always present, but when we come to this sacred meal, when we come to this sacred meal, we know that God is uniquely present, and we experience God's grace, which is simply God's desire to have a relationship with us. We enter fully into the history of God's love, and we enter fully into the hope of God's future. And so we begin, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give them thanks and praise. 
It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, gave it to each of his friends, as he gives us to each one of us today, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to each of his friends as he gives it to each one of you today, saying, take, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant that will be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time you drink of this, do so in remembrance. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. For out your Holy Spirit and us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now we join together as the people of Salem United Methodist Church. We offer the perfect prayer that our Savior gave us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The table has been set, the invitation given. All are welcome to come and celebrate this feast of God's love and feast of God's grace. As has become our custom, I will distribute, offer the bread, and then you will take the individual cups, and when you're done, place them in the basket on the table. <laughs>
as we have now received the great gift of God's grace through our time together and through this sacred table, we now surrender and offer our lives and those things we've been called to prudently steward for the work of building God's kingdom as we bring forward our gifts. Please join us in our closing hymn, which is a familiar one, Just As I Am, with just one plea. And again, this hymn was written in 1835, so very likely in those early <coughs> days of the Salem community, this hymn would have been a standard at each service. So page 357, verses 1, 3, and 5, with an introduction. together as we share God's love, God's word, and God's peace. I do want to say a very special thank you to everyone who helped out uh, with our Heritage Day celebration yesterday. Penny with the food. Excellent work. <coughs> Penny doesn't like to be thanked. But uh, she did an excellent job. You okay, we did it. <laughs> you can all be, all be seated. She did an, an excellent job. A lot of experience from Maryville Food Service. She did make three people take off their baseball hats before they could eat. So that was good. <laughs> also to Donna and Adam for their hard work. Adam and, and Joe setting up the chairs and, and taking them down. A lot of people participated to make it to make it a great day. And so I say thank you to all of you. 
And I also say thank you to each of you for the Christian witness in your lives, for the love you show, the hope you give me, the hope you give to one another, and the hope you provide to the world. And so now it is my blessing to ask each of us to recall the great blessing in our lives from God. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ touch and transform each of your hearts in ways that heal and give hope. May the love of God surround you, protect you, nurture, and sustain you. And as you walk this human journey, may you take each step in communion with God's Holy Spirit. Let us go in peace to embrace those the world rejects. Let us go in peace to be united with all who suffer. Let us go in peace to carry forward God's love. Amen. Amen. And let us conclude today, as we do each Sunday, by simply acknowledging our greatest hope. We are a people loved by God. May we give a sign to the world of God's love. And as has, been, and as has become our custom, I ask Donna to select uh, special music for today. Uh, this is a special birthday blessing song by an artist named Jermaine Tay. I mistakenly, when she asked me to listen to it, I thought it was Jermaine Taylor. For those of you who do, who do not know, Jermaine Taylor is a very famous boxer. So I kept pulling up pictures of this person beating other people up. So I wasn't quite sure how that was going to be celebrating our birthday. But I finally found this song, and I think it's very appropriate. Oh. Uh -huh. 